Hi everyone, uh, welcome back. So today we're going to discuss uh, social influence and how important the role of social others are in determining our attitudes, beliefs, our values, our behaviors. Um, and then this chapter will sort of lead naturally into next week's chapter. And I always include these, these nice images at the beginning and images throughout, um, but I don't give the image credit. Um, for for the images at the beginning so in case you're curious this is a still from the uh from the movie mishima a life in four chapters uh which is an excellent movie about uh the author yukio mishima so yeah uh very relevant to this chapter i can assure you so uh in terms of our learning objectives um my goal is that by the end of this uh lecture you'll have a, have a better understanding of how the self is a product of the plurality of the social influences that you encounter uh, across the lifespan, um, and how this reflects uh, our human sort of natural propensity for social influence, for being influenced by social others. Um, and we're also going to talk about uh, how... Uh, social contagion kind of manifests in everyday modern life and, and even your lives and um, you know hopefully you'll be able to explain this and understand this phenomenon of social contagion next we're going to talk about social roles and the power of roles in directing our behavior um, and specifically we're going to apply this to the stanford prison experiment so by the end of this lecture you should be able to understand and retell this sort of story around the stanford prison experiment this very kind of infamous uh experiment in social psychology then we'll talk about conformity which is the, the tendency to go along with the group even when they're wrong so hopefully you should understand this phenomenon and how it uh how it gets applied uh in social psychology and also uh understanding uh, the uh, seminal studies of conformity and then lastly we'll talk about obedience uh, which is the idea of applying power through hierarchies to people below you in the hierarchy and specifically we'll talk about again another very sort of important infamous uh, study in social psychology which is or set of studies which is the the milgram obedience studies Okay, so I'm going to try to move through this section relatively quickly because um, it's introductory, introductory material and we should just get to the, the sort of the more enticing stuff. So social influences are all the various ways that uh, humans impact one another's beliefs, attitudes, values, behaviors, whatever. Um, and, you know, they're affected by lots of things, family, culture, media, friends, your bosses, your coworkers, your the you know people on your bowling team whatever so like all the sort of social others that don't necessarily fit into these nice categories you can probably think of many um and it includes even strangers and like imagined social others uh so these influences persist throughout the lifespan and they sort of constantly mold and remold and adjust uh who we are um, and basically we are the product of these influences. Yes, there is sort of a self, a self-directing self, but in many ways we're just the sort of combined influence of every person that we encounter in some way throughout our, throughout our lives. Um, and in fact, we're arguably built to rely on the influence of other people. We, we, we naturally emulate the behavior of others, um, and we actually rely on this kind of social influence and social learning more than any other organism that we're aware of. Um, and this is evident across a, a series of different domains of evidence, like children uh, learn by emulating the behavior of their family and their friends or you know something that they see on TV or in public. Um, adults actually still automatically mimic the mannerisms and the disposition of people that they interact with. They mimic their stance or their kind of like energy or their like moods. Um, and we talked about this a few chapters ago, but we, we even have these mirror neurons uh, that are specifically and solely designed 
to allow us to replicate the behaviors of others, first mentally representing them, and then perhaps turning that into a, an actual concrete replication or mimicry um, of, of the behavior. Um, and we actually even automatically shift our attitudes um, to be more in line with those that we like. The more we like someone, the more we're likely to do it. Um, and this is a well-documented effect, the chameleon effect, and basically it, it enables us to quickly and unconsciously change ourselves, adjust ourselves to better resemble the people that we like. Um, it's, it's to help us achieve group cohesion um, and to, to sort of belong better and to fit, fit in better. Um, and group cohesion is such an important part of, of human existence, right? So we have this wide array of tools that allow us to, to learn from each other, um, to emulate each other, to blend in with each other, um, because all of this, all of these things, uh, can be helpful and beneficial in, um, getting us, uh, to to get along better, to cohere better as a group, um, and this is sort of emblematic of of our species, of our species as like a social species, basically as a highly uh, a social organism. Um, and uh, in case this this sort of idiom here at the bottom requires explanation, um, just in case you're not familiar with the. The English idiom, um, birds of a feather flock together. This is the idea that, you know, people who are alike come together naturally um, by virtue of them being alike. And so I've sort of inverted it here to to illustrate the argument that um, actually by virtue of being together, it kind of makes you more alike. It's like the opposite of what the idiom is, is suggesting. So we're so good at this kind of automatic mimicry uh, and attitude or belief sharing that ideas and, and feelings and behaviors can, can spread like rapidly and spontaneously um, uniting kind of barely related groups of people into entities that almost like behave as if they have one mind. Uh, so these are what's called social contagions and they can take many, many forms. Um, so the textbook talks about laughs and yawns and moods and goals and depression. All of these things can be contagious amongst certain groups of people. Um, and that's what the, that's what the textbook talks about. But I think there are way more complex and interesting and novel and strange and important examples of social contagions. And these are the ones that we really want to talk about, at least in my opinion. These are the ones that are, are sort of um, much more uh, chewy. There's, 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 there's more to sort of dig into there. Um, so I'm just going to quickly kind of run through a few examples of this. So think about how a few years ago, how quickly the, the white supremacists unite the, rally, uh, unite the right rally um, in Charlottesville in the United States uh, formed. Um, so there was this white supremacist rally and it formed as a gathering of the alt-right and also it should be noted like the regular right. It's not like the, yeah, I mean the regular right is also responsible. <laughs> um, so they all came together in support of white supremacy and, and other similar white right-wing political goals. Um, and this event sort of, uh, you know, was intensely chaotic and you had you know these marches of, of um white people um uh in the streets you know yelling like uh you will not replace us and this kind of thing and it eventually culminated in you know utter chaos and the actual murder of a counter protester and you know even more recently um uh, in, in the summer of 2020, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests uh, sparked by the murder of George Floyd by police, um, they took place in over 60 countries worldwide and included millions of people um, demonstrating all against police brutality. And, um, you know, obviously this, this sort of inciting event was in the United States, but uh, you know, these, these protests, these demonstrations took place all over the world. This contagion spread throughout the globe. Um, they took place in every province and territory in Canada, it should be noted, right? Um, and this political movement, as you all likely know, is, is still going strong today. And, you know, it's worth noting Black Lives Matter didn't start in 2020. This, this is many years old, but the sort of George Floyd protests were a, a kind of a... Um, 
a huge event in the sort of Black Lives Matter history and, you know, the, the political movement still, like I said, still going strong today. Um, and then maybe the most recent example of something like this is the Stop the Steal rally uh, at the United States Capitol building or, or in, I guess, Washington, D.C., um, which culminated in these right wingers storming the Capitol building in, uh, in DC. Um, so there was these thousands of right wingers, um, sort of surrounding and storming the Capitol building so that they could prevent like the certification of Joe Biden's presidential victory because they thought, you know, Trump really won and the, the election was stolen or whatever. Um, and this actually resulted in the deaths of five people, you know, again, sort of culminated in, complete chaos and um uh you know and, and basically the this this mood these beliefs these behaviors this kind of energy spread throughout all these people like a contagion so you know hence so, social contagion um and it's worth noting that all of these kind of giant world rending examples, these cataclysmic examples that I've just given were in the past four years. Like that's just four years. Um, so the idea here is that we're all so primed to take on the social and mental and behavioral content of, uh, of social others that it can erupt in these kind of massive, sometimes great, sometimes terrible, terrifying ways. Um, uh, but in our lifetimes, uh, we've seen a completely new novel form of social contagion, um, which is, uh, you know, the protests, protests are old, right? Protests are, uh, protests have been around as long and demonstrations have been around as long as humans have. Um, but something, something new, uh, that you probably won't see in your textbooks, at least not yet, not for another few years, is based on an idea proposed by, uh, Richard Dawkins, the, the, evolutionary biologist a few decades ago, um, but it actually only manifested recently in the last 15 years or so it became a sort of a real force in the world. So I'll give you, I'll give you a hint. Maybe you've already figured it out from these sort of clues, but if you were in online in January, 2021, uh, there's a few days where you almost certainly saw, uh, this guy around. And if you saw him, you probably also saw him or maybe you saw him or him or him, 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 uh, or him. <laughs> so I'm of course talking about memes, right? Memes are a form of social contagion. There is a basic idea or a pattern or a structure and it gets passed along between us. Um, it doesn't just have to be like behavior or crowds or mobs or political and righteous fury. Sometimes it's just simple little jokes or ideas or concepts or structures, you know, the, in the form of these memes. Um, and as we all know, like they can feel contagious. They can spread like wildfire. They, they sort of take on a life of their own, just like this, this Bernie meme did for, uh, for a few days after the, uh, uh, United States American, um, presidential inauguration. So memes are just kind of like the newest and in some ways kind of the most evocative instantiation of this concept. And, uh, God, I, I hope, uh, that, that didn't just completely fall flat. I'm assuming that some of you <laughs> are familiar with this Bernie meme. Otherwise you're going to be intensely confused about what I'm talking about, but you know, you probably all are aware of memes. I'm, I'm sure. So the, the overall idea here is that we're so primed and ready for social learning and exchange and mimicry and absorption and radicalization that it it dominates huge swaths of our lives from small to large right so like we learn new words and phrases from our friends or like we watch our roommates sweep and like learn how to sweep better or we pick up our like political beliefs and our sense of humor from the internet um, and sometimes we end up out in the streets infected with some social contagion, you know, perhaps great, perhaps terrible, something so infectious that it unites us all into like a single mega organism acting with one set of thoughts, beliefs, and actions. Um, this is, this is why I suggest that we're the products of our social influence, um, because of how kind of, uh, embedded in all acts of life that social influence is. So, um, 
I hope you enjoyed that little diversion into like um, recent topics and like uh, funny Bernie memes. Cause uh, the le- the the rest of this lecture is like it's gonna be a drag. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I don't know, gird yourself basically, but so uh, some social influence takes the form of, of actualized real social others and other forms of social influence are implied or imagined or constructed kind of mentally. And one very important form of this kind of, uh, social influence is social roles. So social roles are like our generalized ideas of how certain classes of people must behave. Um, so they're like a bit like stereotypes. Um, so, you know, we have ideas of how men should behave and how women should behave or how professors should behave or how hockey players should behave and, you know, so on. Um, and these ideas, uh, these, these roles are created using information transmitted from the usual suspects, right? Our parents, media, culture, friends, so on. This isn't anything new to you. I'd imagine we've kind of talked about this and also you, you understand this probably intuitively. What might be new to you is just how powerful these roles can be in determining our behavior. Uh, so it is time to talk about the Stanford prison experiment. So I'd imagine many of you have heard of this. Um, It's one of the two most infamous studies in social psychological history. Uh, So in this study, um, a researcher named Philip Zimbardo and his colleagues recruited young men for a a very elaborate study. So in this study, Zimbardo created a a mock prison in a basement in a building in in, in Stanford University. Um, And he randomly assigned, this is very important, he randomly assigned each of these men to be either a prisoner or a guard in the mock prison. So the men were all from similar middle-class backgrounds. They were screened for psychological or physical issues. The, you know, there were anyone with anything major was, was uh, omitted from the study. And so they were all taken in to the prison. The guards were given uniforms, whistles, nightsticks, and the prisoners were dressed in sort of prison inmate clothing and the guards were given basic instructions uh, you know they were told that they had to kind of uh, keep a certain routine keep the prisoners on a certain routine they had to sort of keep control of the prison naturally like like guards would um, and otherwise they were kind of given freedom right there were there were um, they weren't told what to do they were just told like what goals they needed to complete and within days, the guards were viciously abusing the prisoners, um, sadistically and cruelly punishing them, and just completely taking advantage of that power, that minimal power that they had been given. And the prisoners, on the other hand, they fell into depressive states where they acted wild and enraged, or they uh, like banded together to fight a rebellion against the tyrannical guards. And so the experiment was supposed to last two weeks, but the whole thing was called off after six days because they were so worried about the well-being of the people who were participating in this study. And so the idea here is that social roles are so powerful that they can make ostensibly normal people into callous and sadistic authoritarians um, just by using like a uniform and some basic set design. Um, And this experiment has like all kinds of problems, both ethical and methodological. I could, I could talk for an entire lecture on this, on this study. And I don't think it's really necessary because I think, I think its main point and its main message are, are, are still fairly obvious, even considering those ethical and methodological issues. Um, and like it's ethical issues should be self-evident, hopefully right of how like you shouldn't set people up for that kind of abuse in research. <laughs> um, But there are also some concerns about, like, the validity and the replicability of the experiment. But, um, uh, like, like for example, some people have suggested that Zimbardo's presence in the experiment was likely to create demand characteristics. Demand characteristics are where the participants just kind of do what they think the researcher wants them to do. This is a sort of a perennial concern in social psychological or all psychological research. Um, and others have pointed out that the, the small sample size makes a study effectively worthless in, in terms of like how it represents the greater population. What can we do to generalize the findings to the greater population? And these concerns are valid. They're totally valid. But 
the experiment still has something to tell us. And this is its main message, I think, is that like without too much pressure, people can be capable of great cruelty. Um, it takes surprisingly little pressure and surprisingly little preparation. Basically, what happened was these men understood how guards were supposed to behave and how prisoners were supposed to behave. And so they naturally carried out those behaviors. Basically, we are what we pretend to be. This is the power of the social role, is that just by understanding what a certain role is supposed to be, we kind of naturally fall into that role and take on the qualities and beliefs and attitudes and behaviors of that of that role. And, you know, this, this, this experiment was done many decades ago, uh, and it was a study, and maybe you think... I don't know, maybe you maybe you don't believe it, right? Maybe you think Zimbardo was manipulating the participants or the, the results are exaggerated or whatever. So if you don't believe that example, um, it turns out we don't actually have to look very far to find basically the same thing in the real world. So the United States military is uh, pretty well known, I would say, for its, uh, its many, many war crimes, atrocities, human rights violations over the past 70 years or so all across the world and, and basically every continent. <laughs> um, and the, the United States imperialist war in Vietnam and Cambodia and Laos, for example, um, th this war was filled with examples of soldiers acting cruelly and viciously towards, you know, opposing soldiers and citizens alike. So, you know, this included the killing, maiming, torturing, sexual assault of hundreds, perhaps thousands of innocent men, women, elderly people, children. It didn't matter, right? And what's especially notable about that world war, war is that the the soldiers were primarily drafted into the military. So it wasn't like only callous and violent men joined the army because they were callous and violent, right? You, you might make that claim today, but back then they were drafted. So many of these men were forced into the military and they still ended up acting in this sadistic way. And, you know, this is obviously an extremely complicated topic, like the behavior of soldiers, American soldiers or U.S. American soldiers, I should say, in the uh, Vietnam War is a highly complicated topic but i think part of it is this this idea of the social role i think it still illustrates the power of the social role and in case you think it's a thing of the past from from a war you know from before any of us were born um i'm afraid to tell you that it is not the united states ran a military prison in iraq uh in 2003 or you know in the early 2000s um by the name of abu Ghraib. Ghraib. Sorry, that, that is an Anglo bastardization. I recognize that the, that is not the proper pronunciation. Um, and uh, this military prison is very famous uh, for its acts of sadistic treatment, punishment, sexual abuse, torture, rape, and murder of its own prisons by the United States military. Um, these acts were seemingly done primarily as a form of entertainment for the United States troops, um, and it included dragging prisoners around on dog leashes, starving them, covering them in human excrement, um, sexually humili humiliating them, and uh, just a wide variety of other really repulsive and, and you know twisted atrocities. Um, and it, of course, included a wide range of just torture, just traditional torture and murder. Um, any anything to kind of increase the the pain and suffering of um, of these prisoners, and these troops, the the ones that were deployed to Vietnam and the ones that were deployed to Iraq, they all understand the role of a soldier. The role is someone who is violent and cruel and sadistic and torturous, and so they fulfill that role. They understand what is kind of expected of them as a soldier and they do it that's the power of the role and i would argue that the united states military recognizes that this is the role that troops fill i i think that they know that and that's why almost none of the people who did any of these heinous acts were ever brought to justice in in the case of vietnam or abu Ghraib. like almost no one was was uh, punished in any meaningful or substantial way, a couple of people, and that was it. 
So despite all of that, the the you know, the United States military recognized that this is the this is the social role, and so they can't punish people for basically doing what's expected of them. And like it's not just the role. I know that. I'm not arguing that it's just the role that caused all of these horrible behaviors in um, in, in Southeast Asia and in uh, Iraq. Um, as with all psychological phenomena, it's extremely complicated. There are many, 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 many causes. Um, and, you know, it sort of behooves me to point out that uh, one of the causes here is just... Uh, good old-fashioned racism, right? Like, that is a major component in the American um, imperial project, uh, and and that's part of why uh, so, such sort of heinous and repulsive acts are carried out on other uh, uh, developing countries um, repeatedly and constantly by the American military, U.S. American military. Um, so it, it's not just a social role. I know that. But hopefully I've illustrated that we are compelled automatically to at least partially fulfill the social roles that we understand are applied to us. And I know that that was like an incredibly dark and unpleasant thing to discuss. And the, the textbook doesn't go into nearly that much detail, but I think it's really important that we don't like hide or suppress or de-emphasize the effect of these social influences, because it turns out that they can compel us to, to, to carry out some of the most depraved acts iman- imaginable and like ever carried out by humans. So it's, I think it's important that we stare that in the face and we really understand this because I, I mean, what, what, what's the point of studying this stuff if we're not going to think about it and talk about it realistically, right? Okay. So, uh, you know, I am sorry about that, uh, gold star for getting through that horrible mire of, of content. Um, I recognize that it is uh, highly unpleasant, but again, I think it's very important. So hopefully you're, you're uh, on board with me there. Um, it doesn't get a lot better from here on out in the lecture, <laughs> but I promise that nothing is quite as bad as that last slide. Um, okay. So, uh, one major social influence related, of course, to all the other ones that we've discussed so far is, um, conformity. So you all probably know what this is. Conformity is a tendency for us to alter our beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors to bring them in line with those of others. Um, And, you know, I don't think anyone would doubt its presence and its importance in society. Like I said, you probably all kind of already know this and have had personal experiences with it. But social psychologists trying to study it, that's a little bit more difficult. And they've had to find some pretty clever and novel designs for kind of isolating the phenomenon. Um, and so one of these kind of famous studies was carried out by uh, Muzaffar Sheriff, um, in which he tried to show that even basic uh, like sensation and perception can be influenced by conformity. So for this study, Sheriff took advantage of uh, a perceptual illusion called the autokinetic effect, um, in which uh, sort of a small point of light is shown on a wall in a dark room, and it appears basically to move around a small amount. Um, This is like an already understood sort of visual illusion. So Sheriff had participants... um, first uh, make estimates of how much the point of light moved, okay, by themselves. And then he would put them all together in a room and would have them make the estimates again. And what he found was that although in the beginning participants made like wildly different estimates of of how much the point of light was moving um, when they were by themselves, after a few trials, which were held across a handful of days, um, they actually all ended up coming to agree on the same estimate. So you can see here, um, they start, uh, maybe I can get my laser pointer here. Um, they start with completely different, um, uh, estimates on, on how much, uh, the point of light is moving. Um, but then on the second day they're getting closer basically because they're all kind of like calling out their estimates and starting to be influenced by one another. And then they're getting closer. And then by, you know, after three days, they just all agree on the same, that it's the same estimate. Um, and he also found that, uh, if he, if he put 
um, a confederate in the study and had them make really sort of large um, uh, overestimates, um, then he could get everyone to kind of agree to higher, much higher estimates than they would have otherwise. So he can sort of plant someone in there and they'll be influenced by them, even if that person is like not accurate or correct. Um, and then follow-up studies actually showed that the, the participants didn't just agree to these estimates to get along with others. They actually truly and privately believed in the estimates. So this is the power of conformity is that like it can even um, kind of push around our, our most like basic perceptions, if that makes sense. Um, and so in the, in the tradition of these studies, a, a few decades later, um, another social, psycholo uh, social psychologist by the name of Solomon Ash carried out another series of very important uh, studies on conformity. And so in these studies, uh, a group of participants would be shown like a series of lines. I'll show you what this looks like in a second, but I'm going to describe it to you first. Um, they would be shown a series of lines of different length and then um, a single separate line to which to compare those lines. Um, and basically the participants are all asked to just state which of these lines best matches the length of the single separate line. Um, and so then they each take a turn seeing uh, which line matches the separate line. Um, but secretly, there's actually only one participant in this group, even though they're, they're, they're all sort of pretending to be participants. Um, the rest are confederates planted to kind of discreetly manipulate the flow of the experiment. So for the first few trials, everyone says the obviously correct answer. Um, so in this case, the obviously correct answer is C, right? Um, but then um, eventually, all the confederates say the obviously incorrect answer, which is A. Um, and after kind of each of the people in the group says the incorrect answer, um, the turn comes to the true participant. Um, and you kind of have to wonder, you know, how do you think you would respond? Would you say the, the, the correct answer that you know to be correct? Or would you go along with everyone else who's all saying the obviously wrong answer, but maybe they know something you don't, or maybe there's something wrong with your eyes or what? Like, uh, you know, all these people are obviously wrong, but they're all saying the same thing. And what Ash found was that 75% of participants uh, actually went with the group majority uh, uh, with a wrong answer on at least one trial. Um, and uh, across all trials, in all participants, um, participants actually conform to the group majority's obviously wrong answers 37% of the time. And so in Sheriff's study, the, the, the light one that I talked about a moment ago, participants doubted their own perceptions because the case actually was ambiguous, like how much the point of light was moving. In Ash's study, in this line study, there's nothing ambiguous. Participants knew that they had the correct answer and, and they interviewed them later to follow up on this. But they they went along with the group because of the normative influence of the group, the immense pressure to do what other people are doing just in order to fit in, in order to kind of not make waves so that you're liked and so that you can avoid rejection. And basically, people go along with the group because they fear disapproval from others. And like I said, inter follow-up interviews basically confirm this fact. They don't want to stick out and like risk ostracism. Um... And so in this way, social influence kind of exerts its pressure automatically because we have our own fear of exclusion and rejection, and it automatically pushes us towards behaving like other people, even when we know it's wrong, even when we know it's wrong to, to do so, or that it's the wrong behavior. Okay, so uh, the, the last couple of forms of social influence that we discussed, they were kind of subtle and mostly implicit, um, or in many ways implicit. Uh, and in some ways, they actually were imagined, uh, not even real. They were kind of perceptual, and that's it. Um, but our next and final topic for this lecture is typically neither uh, of those things, neither subtle nor implicit. Um, so we're going to talk about obedience. And obedience 
is simply doing what someone else tells you to do. Pressuring someone to obey is typically direct, it's explicit, it's commanding, um, and this is probably one of the most familiar and common forms of social influence to you all, since basically we essentially spend our whole lives, you know, obeying one person or another, be it a parent or a teacher or a boss or a spouse or a supervisor, in my case, or a cop or a sovereign power, whatever, right? And each of these cases represents some person who is, uh, quote unquote, above you in some way, big or small, um, and has power over you. Uh, so in this way, obedience is typically directed through the use of power um, in hierarchical structures. Um, and uh, there are some cases where we obey people who have no power over us and are not, quote unquote, above us. So, for example, if I see a stranger litter, I might say, like, hey, pick that up. Don't litter, you know, and maybe she does. So maybe she picks it up, um, even though I don't have any power over her. Um but generally speaking, it's it's you know it's a sort of a relation uh, amongst power and amongst hierarchies, um, and generally speaking, obedience is regarded positively in our society. Um, obeying authority figures is is thought to be like crucial to the peaceful and prosperous running of our society. But of course, there are obvious and important examples, um, you know, cases where obedience has had catastrophic outcomes for the world and you know the seminal example of this is of course the nazi holocaust right where the german population obediently carried out an attempted genocide against jews socialists and communists gays and lesbians the roma poles the disabled black germans and so on um and the holocaust ends up being the inspiration for the social psychological investigation of obedience because it basically asked a lot of scientists to, to wonder, you know, how could millions of people willingly carry out such evil and, and deranged acts? And here's where we'll meet Stanley Milgram. So Stanley Milgram is uh, is an American social psychologist and he didn't think that Germans were evil per se. It's not as if, like, they all spontaneously became evil overnight sometime in the 1930s. Rather, he thought that they carried out these sort of heinous acts because of their, like, cultural tendency towards authority and tendency towards obedience. Their, their kind of, like, respect of authority in German culture and German society. And Milgram theorized that Americans, who are much less prone to obedience, he felt, um, would not be nearly as receptive to this sort of obedience to authority. So, um, you know how earlier I mentioned that the Stanford Prison Experiment was uh, one of the two most infamous social psychological studies? Uh, well, we're about to talk about the other most infamous social psychological study, the Milgram Obedience Studies. So, in these studies, and they were carried out in the 1960s, Participants were brought to a lab, uh, paid a reasonable sum before their participation, um, and they were told that they were going to participate in a study on how uh, punishment affects learning. Um, so present with them was uh, uh, another participant who was actually secretly a, a confederate. And so then the researcher explained to the two participants, again, one real one, one confederate, that one person would be, quote unquote, randomly selected to be the teacher and one would be randomly selected to be the learner. Of course, this was not actually random. Um, and the true participant was always assigned to be the teacher. Um, and the confederate was always assigned to be the learner. So the learner was then strapped into a chair um, and attached to electrodes, and both participants were told that these electrodes uh, were designed to deliver electric shocks to the learner. So the learner would have to perform a memory task, um, and then whenever he made a mistake, uh, the teacher, who again is the real participant, the teacher would deliver him, the confederate, a shock. So the shocks were, uh, of course, fake, right? Um, but the Confederate pretended to be in real pain. 
Um, and the participants believed that they were administering real shocks to a, to a fellow participant. So basically the way it would work is a teacher would call out some word. Um, the, the, the lear- this isn't the important bit, but the learner was supposed to learn pairings of certain words. And the teacher would call out one word. And if the learner didn't know the correct answer, um, then the uh, teacher would have to administer a shock. And the, the teacher, again, that's the real participant, would administer a shock by flipping a switch on a generator that had 30 switches uh, labeled from 15 volts to 450 volts. And the labels on the higher value switches eventually read very strong shock, intense shock, extreme intensity shock, and danger severe shock. So, you know, we've been talking about this this sort of topic for a while now, and, uh, you know, this study is infamous for a reason, so you can probably guess where I'm going with this. It turns out Americans aren't resilient to obeying evil acts that are instructed to them by authority figures. As the study progressed and the learner made mistakes, the teacher would always keep administering shocks. The learner would bang on the walls, would grunt, would scream out in pain, um, and the teacher would keep administering the, the, the shocks. Um, and after the 300 volt shock, the learner would uh, stop providing answers at all and would stop reacting in pain. Um, the implication, of course, being that you know the, the person had passed out or worse. And if the uh, learner didn't respond for 10 seconds, the experimenter told the participant to administer a shock because waiting 10 seconds was... Um, counted as an as an incorrect response basically and if participants expressed uncertainty about continuing the experiment about continuing to administer these shocks the experimenter would just say <clears throat> something simple like please continue or you have no other choice you must continue and 65 percent of the participants obeyed fully administering the maximum shock of 450 volts right until the end they never stopped obeying at any point and all participants, every single participant, administered at least a 315-volt thir- shock to this, to this other person, person. So what does this tell us? I would mentioned Americans earlier. It doesn't tell us anything about Americans. It tells us that humans are capable of incredibly cruel and callous acts if they're instructed to carry them out by someone with even the barest of authorities. Um, you know, it's worth noting that this experimenter who's kind of telling you to do these things, he had no power over the participants. He didn't control them in any way. He had no way of like punishing them or reprimanding them for, for like disobeying, for not carrying out the the punishments. Um, in fact, the participants were paid before the study and they were told that the payment was just for coming in. It wouldn't be taken from them that, that they didn't even have to participate. They were told that the payment, the payment was for showing up. And so this tells us that we are incredibly susceptible to the influence of authority. Um, and that this isn't, you know, it's not uniquely German. It's not uniquely American. This appears to be something um, fundamental to humans. And in case you were thinking that this was simply an artifact of the mid 20th century in the, in the 60s when these studies um, were run long before you were born or I was born, um, I have bad news for you. These studies were replicated in a more ethical way in Poland in 2017, and they essentially found the same results. Authority is an incredibly powerful social influence that can compel us into doing truly horrendous acts. And it turns out that what authority means is kind of minimal. It doesn't doesn't require much. It turns out it requires like a lab jacket or like a name tag with Yale written on it or something like that. Right. With very little, um, sort of, uh, actual power, people can hold authority over us and get us to do, um, pretty, pretty disgusting things, pretty, pretty horrendous things. So, um, I just like to close this out with a quote from, um, from Stanley Milgram himself. Um, And I think this quote kind of naturally captures many of the things that we discussed today. And the quote is provided in the textbook, uh, but I thought it was worth lifting and um, reading here aloud because I think it's quite effective. So um, the, the quote is that 
the destruction of the American Indian population, the internment of Japanese Americans, the use of napalm against civilians in Vietnam, all are harsh policies that originated in the authority of a democratic nation and were responded to with the expected obedience. When lecturing, I faced young men who were aghast at the behavior of experimental subjects and proclaimed that they would never behave in such a way, but who, in a matter of months, were brought into the military and performed without compunction actions that made shocking the victim seem pallid. In this respect, they are no better and no worse than human beings of any other era who lend themselves to the purposes of authority and become instruments in its destructive processes. Okay. <laughs> so, um, heavy lecture. Probably the heaviest of the semester, maybe. Let's just quickly summarize and then we can uh, uh, move on for, for the week. So uh, we talked about how the self is a product of um, myriad social influences from all across the lifespan. And then we talked about how uh, social contagion um, can, can foment kind of massive social movements just as easily as it can, you know, little internet jokes. Uh, and we moved on to discussing how even minimal social roles can have massive influences on our behavior. And we, we discussed the, um, the, the Stanford prison experiment along with some, um, sort of recent, um, kind of serious examples from, uh, 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 warfare. Um, next, we talked about how the desire to fit in and belong um, can also seriously influence our behavior and our beliefs, our attitudes, and even, and this is maybe the coolest part, even our basic perception. And then finally, um, we talked about authority and we talked about how even the illusion of authority or the sort of guise of authority can be immensely compelling and it can lead us to, to carry out, uh, you know, horrendous acts that we ostensibly wouldn't do on our own okay so um that's it for the week um i hope you all enjoyed that lecture uh in spite of this sort of more troubling material um to be honest with you this is one of my favorite lectures in the course uh, i think a lot of the best material in the course is actually concentrated in this uh in this chapter and in this lecture and i i, I try to tailor this lecture specifically to things that I think are the most interesting and most important. Um, so, you know, hopefully you enjoyed it. Uh, and we'll just do a quick, a few quick uh, media recommendations for the week, and then uh, that'll be that. So um, my first recommendation this week is uh, Undertale. Undertale's a game from a few years ago. It's available on Switch or computer computer or PlayStation, um, and it is one of my favorite games. Um, it's very strange, it's unique, it's funny, um, but its relevance to this is that it plays heavily with the idea of the social role of uh, the player, the person who is playing video games. It plays on the expectations that you have of what you should do as a player. That is the like kind of primary thrust of the game Undertale. I recommend it highly. I think many, many, many of you would love this game, even if you don't play video games. I, like, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's such a good game. Um, so, I don't know, maybe maybe look into it. Um, the, the next recommendation I have is the comic book Saga. Um, I'm sure some of you have read this because it's, it's kind of very popular, but those of you who have not read it, you should. Um, Saga uh, is a like it's it's a comic book but it's not you know it's not superhero-y at all it's very it's very literary um so I, I i would recommend checking it out even if you're not so hot on comic books because the art's amazing but so is the writing um so saga deals a lot with social roles um with influence uh with obedience um and with disobedience uh, is i would say a pretty major theme actually of, of this book so um it's excellent and it's on a break right now so it's a good time to catch up and then uh you can sort of tune in again for the, for the finale uh this is a recommendation that uh every one of you is probably familiar with but probably not many of you have actually read um so this is the original book uh of frankenstein it's called frankenstein or the modern prometheus this book deals more with um the kind of first lecture from this week and you know it talks about 
uh, the self and motivations relating to the self and the desire for consistency and the desire to be good and worthwhile and to feel um, to feel you know beloved on this earth um, and it's not really a horror it is a gothic book but it's not really horrific in any way I love this book I think it's such an injustice that Frankenstein gets mostly talked about as like a horror or as like a thing about a monster it's not really uh, and uh, there aren't really any good ad adaptations of it that I'm personally aware of um, so I would read the original book it's short it's well written it's compelling um, yeah you, you should you should look into it uh, honestly even if you think you won't like it I almost I can almost guarantee you will uh, and then the final recommendation is the Stanley Kubrick film uh, Full Metal Jacket. And this recommendation is almost too on the nose for what we talked about in this lecture. It deals with um, obedience, uh, with authority, with the immense power of the social role. This is an incredibly um, aggressive movie. Uh, like, I wouldn't watch it if you're in the mood for something breezy. It's a very pretty movie, but it's... Uh, incredibly unpleasant in a lot of ways so go into it i guess with that expectation all right um that's it for this week uh thank you very much for your attention and uh i'll see you all soon